Blog Talk Radio. Paranormal Review Radio. And you are listening to Paranormal Review Radio, the only radio show without commercials and with more great paranormal talk. Thank you for joining us tonight. I'm Anthony Agati in New York. And I'm Lucy Liebfried in Chicago. Put the kids in bed and get comfy because you're about to have a paranormal Friday night. Welcome friends, family, fellow investigators, and those who are new to the field. Do you have a question to ask us or a story to tell? Well, don't worry. You have two ways to be heard. Call into the show and be on air live by dialing 661-244-9831. Press the number 1 to get your call in queue, or you can type your questions in the chat room. Anthony and I will refer to them during the show. And if you're listening on the archives or on YouTube, well then, make sure to get here on Friday nights live. Now, when you're not listening to us, you can check out our Facebook page and YouTube channel for some cool articles, videos, show highlights, and promotions. And if that's not enough, you can always drop us a line at paranormal.review at AOL.com. Okay, kids, it's time for Paranormal Review Radio. But, you know, <clears throat> as doing research for tonight's sh- show... I went on angelfire.com, and I'm not sure if everybody's familiar with that website, um, but angelfire.com describes star people as humans with recent past lifetime on another planet, with human bodies born and raised as one of us, in spirit still being who they were before entering this world of ours. They are here to not forget who they are, to remember and realize the reasons of their stay, There are many star people in this world today. Many of them have forgotten their past and origins and have questions unanswered. Whether you call them star people, aliens, extraterrestrials, the phenomenon of of otherworldly beings visiting this planet has fascinated mankind for centuries and their stories are being heard. Tonight, we speak to Dr. Artie Sixkiller Clark, who has written a book called Encounters with Star People, untold stories of American Indians, in which she shares countless stories from many Native American cultures and elders that need to be understood. Dr. Clark, a retired professor of Montana State University, has dedicated her life and career to working with indigenous populations. She has been adopted by enrolled tribal members and given traditional names by three Northern Plains spiritual leaders, including Blackfeet, Women with Great Knowledge, the Northern Cheyenne, Walks All Woman, and the Lakota Sioux, Woman Who Helps People. She holds degrees in English, history, psychology, and educational leadership. She is also a licensed therapist and author of several children's books and the best-selling Sisters in the Blood. She lives in Montana with her husband, Kip, her beloved Lasso Apso Prairie Rose, and her Maine Coon cat, Rez Perez. Her second book in the field of ufology, Sky People, Untold Stories of Alien Encounters in Mesoamerica, was released just last month in December. While retired from academia, she continues to travel and interview individuals throughout the indigenous world about their encounters with UFOs and aliens. Please welcome to the show Dr. Artie Sixkiller Clark. Welcome, Dr. Clark. Thank you for coming on the show tonight. Well, thank you for inviting me. Hello, Dr. Clark. It is such a pleasure to have you on the show. You know, being Native American myself, I know firsthand that many of my ancestors' spiritual or what some call paranormal stories have always been something that we held close and hardly ever told friends or outsiders. Now, that's right. How, di- <laughs> how difficult was it for you to get American Indians to confide in you and share their stories for this book? Well, first of all,
of all, I'd like to say that the definition that I use for star people was certainly not the de- definition that was read um, uh, according to Angel Fire, because star people, uh, as I define them, are um, uh, those from the stars, not uh, the contemporary definition of people who um, have have recently died and have returned or take the form of a you know the star child the star people uh it's very different in in native cultures or in indigenous cultures worldwide um and so that definition doesn't uh, uh isn't um an appropriate definition for um the star people um uh, and sky people of of the books that I've written Okay. Well, what made you decide to write this book with Native Americans? Well, if you're talking about the first book, when I, I, um, um, when I, as growing up, as you mentioned, you know, you hear the stories about the star people, mm-hmm. um, and the ancestors and the people who came from the stars and, and how your blood has the, blood of the star people in it but it dates back to ancient times to to our very beginnings not recent um interaction with with star people and um but as a child you know i heard those stories but as i grew up you know you put away the stories of your childhood um you go to college you get a job and then then you focus on those kinds of, of things and um, when I came to Montana State University as a, a newly employed assistant professor, um, I was also hired as the director of the Center for Bilingual and Multicultural Education. And that center focused on recruiting um, Native American students from the Northern Plains Tribal Region. And we even reached down as far as, as uh, Alaska or uh, Arizona um, and even Alaska. We had students in our program from Alaska. But what I would do is I would write federal grants and get money for underserved populations. And since there were so few teachers and principals and superintendents who were even working on reservations with almost 100% native student population, our goal at the, in the College of Education at Montana State was to recruit and train and teachers who were native, who would go back to the reservation and teach and lead the school districts. And on my first recruitment trip, um, a young man um, uh, set up a meeting with students who were interested in the program. And after I met with them and I told them what I could offer them and gave them all the application materials and everything, uh, he said to me, he said, would you know, would you like to go to dinner? In a, in, a, in a neighboring town. And so we did that, and on the way back to the reservation, he, he suggested, he said, you know, if you've got a few minutes, I'd like to show you something. So he took me up into the mountains um, above his village, and we parked up there, and he reached over and got a pair of binoculars, and he said, come with me. He said, uh, if we're lucky, they'll come. And I said, who will come? And he said, well, the star people. And so we sat there on this boulder for a couple of hours, and they didn't come. But he, he, as we sat there, he told me the stories of his tribe and their connection with, with the star people and the cosmos. And so on my way back to the university, I kept thinking, I wonder how many tribes have similar stories to what I grew up with. And so as I was traveling around Uh, you know, to all of the different reservations, going to conferences, and then I got involved in research heavily on um, Native, uh, on on reservations. I just casually, when, you know, go out to dinner or have lunch or if I were staying over on the weekend, um, and then going to conferences, and uh, I started asking people about their ancient star legends. And I began recording them, and then as time passed, I began saying, well, have you ever seen a UFO? And so people began telling me their stories. 
And there was a time, you know, I mean, occasionally people would would uh, would seek me out and say, you know, I have a story to tell, and I've never told anybody this story. And on other occasions, people would say, well, you know, I have an aunt that really had an interesting encounter, or I had a brother. And so it just kind of snowballed from there. And I, you know, for 25, 30 years, I've been collecting those stories. And um, uh, I hadn't done anything with them. I had shoeboxes full of tapes. I had notebooks. And um, after I retired at MSU, I was offered the next year to come out of retirement and to uh, be an external evaluator for my $5 million a year grant on an Indian reservation. And so I went back to um, um, D.C., and I went through the training and uh, that was put on by, by uh, the government. And then the next week after I got back from D.C., I went down to the, to the reservation. And we're planning out all the different aspects, the leadership aspect, the, the uh, you know, how we're going to train the staff, how we're going to evaluate each component. And we broke for lunch. And um, this older woman who is in, involved uh, um, in the project, somehow this, the topic of UFOs came up. And I don't believe I brought it up. I think somebody else in the group brought it up, but I don't have a recollection of how it happened. But anyway, um, I began telling them a couple of the stories that I had collected. And this lady looked at me and she said, well, what's going to happen to all this, this stuff, all these stories? And I said, well, uh, nothing. I said, I suppose. She said, well, what about after you pass? And I said, well, They'll probably just get destroyed. And she said, well, I think you have a responsibility to tell those stories. I think you have a responsibility to write a book. That's part of our oral history, and you have a responsibility to do that. Well, when I came back home, all the way home, I'm thinking, should I write a book about this? And I'm thinking, you know, I finally have retired. I have released all my obligations. Do I want to commit myself to a five-year, multi-million dollar evaluation uh, evaluation uh, program, or do I want to write a book? And, you know, I had been up until that time working, you know, the last, the last uh, 30 years nonstop, you know, for 12 to 18 hours a a day and uh you know to meet all my obligations and to you know publish for academia to uh travel to uh serve on committees of uh god undergraduate students serve on committees for masters and doctoral students and then speak at conferences and so it just became so overwhelming that i was looking forward to retirement and I thought, I can't do both. I can't commit to doing this evaluation and write a book, too. So I called them up the next day and told them that I really appreciated their faith in me and their oppor- in the opportunity they had offered me, but I decided I was going to write a book. And that's what I did. Well, I'm glad you did. You know what? Eighteen um, months later, it was published. <laughs> Well, you know what? I'm very excited because both you and I are are members of the same tribe. We're both Eastern Band Cherokee. And I know you mentioned, you know, the stories that that you grew up with, the stories that I've heard, you know, basically we know what that is. But in general, what do Native Americans believe that they've been experiencing? Well, I I think uh, that Native Americans think they – you know that they are interacting with with the star people. You know the people from the stars. I think they that in general the the people I interviewed believe there's that life exists in the universe beyond the planet Earth, uh, and that um, in some cases uh, some believe that it is those ancestors who have gone before them, and in some cases they believe that it's 
uh, significantly more important and that it expands the whole universe. Um, and so um, you'll find very little fear mm-hmm. in the interactions of uh, Native, of, of, of indigenous people as a rule with um, their encounters uh, because the ancient legends give them that basis for acceptance. And then you know if you if you look at at the non Indian worldview, it's very different. Um, mm-hmm. It's linear. It's uh, uh, scientific. Uh, um, it's progressive. Where the the Indian point of view is is circular. It begins at one point and it goes around and around and around. It's not linear. It, uh, you know, it's more accepting of, uh, uh, you know, it's more involved in a spiritual world. And, and when I speak of a spiritual world, I'm not talking about the Bible versus Indian beliefs. I'm talking about the ability to see unseen things by the ordinary eye, the ability to embrace spirituality uh, in a manner that doesn't require a book to give directions. Um, and and so I, I think that it's it's um, you know you have to look at that view, at that world view of of uh, and and they don't believe that progression is necessarily the best thing either you know and so that scientific proof means very little to indigenous people I mm-hmm. saw it there it is it's a fact. Mm-hmm. One thing you know? I find kind of interesting that you did mention, and I got that sense when I was reading the first book, is that, like you said, there's kind of like a lack of fear. It's more like an acceptance, and that's exactly how I, I, I got what I got from the book. I mean, it just seemed right. so natural when people were relating their stories. It just was factual, and it there there wasn't that sense of fear. Mm-hmm. Well, and and um, and I think that's based on that oral history that so many of us have grown up with. I mean, you grew up with it. Mm-hmm. I mean, I heard those stories, and so that that um, you know, when when I go to Mexico and somebody starts talking to me about the blue skin people, well, you know, um, uh, um, our tribes believed in the blue skin people. Uh, mm-hmm. They talked about the blue-skinned people who lived underground and came out and had their little gardens above ground, and they had very large eyes, and and uh, they were small, about three, four feet high, but they lived in the caves because they couldn't stand the sunlight. Where they came from, they didn't have the sunlight. So, you know, those are the kinds of things that you start making those connections and saying, you know, uh, I can understand why somebody down here in the jungles of Guatemala can tell me about blue skin people because I've heard a story similar to that. So I don't or I don't question those kinds of things, but I think that's a difference in the research approach that I used and uh, and you know when you start looking at at uh, at research there's you know the the quantitative and the qualitative research. Well, quantitative deals with data and figures and scientific proof. Where um, you know I'm into uh, um, listening to uh, what people have to say and the stories they tell and and how they tell them and how they relate to those stories. And um, uh, you know if you if you look at at um, what has been said about American Indians, for example, or any indigenous people for that matter, it's been suggested that there's actually two perspectives of of qualitative research. There's the etic and the emic. Well, the etic perspective is an outsider's perspective. And they develop that by interpreting from their own experiences what they're observing. And And you've probably read the books about how when the the white man came here that the Indian women did all the work in some tribes 
particularly the Northern Plains tribes. And the male didn't do anything. The male was lazy. Mm -hmm. This observer was speaking, observing from his own perspective from his, and putting his own culture into what he was looking at. Because mm -hmm. in the Native cultures, you know, you had women were responsible for everything involving the home. They put up the teepee. They took down the teepee. They were responsible for cleaning the animal, for tanning the hides, for making the clothes and cooking the meals. The man, on the other hand, was responsible for providing that food and providing the spiritual leadership of the family and the tribe and then protecting it against invaders. So there were specific roles, but when you, an outsider is looking at that, he doesn't see that male role. What he sees is that the women are doing all the work. And mm -hmm. to him, putting up the teepee should have been the man's job any kind of physical labor, where within the Northern Plains tribes that wasn't necessarily the case. Uh, the same thing in the in the Cherokee culture. I mean, the white men called, uh, when they came into contact with the Cherokees, they called us, you know, they said because women could sit in council, women were equal um, with men. They could go to war. They could choose their own husband. They could sit in council. They had all these powers that the white women who came here as colonists had none of those rights. They couldn't own property. They had to defer to their husbands. And so when they looked at this, they called, they humiliated the Cherokee male and called it, you know, said, you know, you have a petticoat government. And when mm -hmm. they took them away and sent them into colleges and schools away from their tribe, they came back and literally enslaved the Cherokee women to please the men and, you know, to please the white men and, and set up a government that was based upon the U.S. Constitution. You know, and so you've got a, um, you've got a lot of things going on there that had nothing to do with the traditional ways of people living. But the Etic researcher looks at things from his perspective, whereas... I like to look at things from an emic perspective, which is the other type of perspective in qualitative research. And that is that you accept the culture and you look at the way the culture envisions their world, how the people, uh, um, an emic uh, researcher is an insider. They try to adopt the insider point of view and they avoid judgments about their observations and their interviews. They don't demand proof. They allow for the acceptance of the stories they're told and the behaviors and information observed and obtained without bringing in their opinion. Because, you know, our tribes, I mean, we have over 500 tribes and they're all very different. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, they have different beliefs. They have different ways of doing things. They have different kinds of governments and different traditions and, and spiritual beliefs. So, you know, you can't, you have to go in and you have to accept whatever, you know, the people tell you. And that's what I did. And I think that's why the researchers haven't had access to this knowledge. Well, you, you know, your book is amazing and, and just chock full of uh, amazing stories, to say the least. Um, and in, in your interviews and the stories that are in the book, um, ha can you share with some of our listeners, have you found that uh, most of the, the, the stories that were related to you by the indigenous folks and, and, um, and, and their relatives or friends, have you found both malevolent and benevolent encounters with these star people? Um more so in in uh in uh Mexico than I did in the United States but again I, I I'm not so sure they were malevolent except that they were interpreted differently uh in in Mexico and in in Mesoamerica I ran on to more superstition uh, still some beliefs and curses that somebody could be cursed I also mm -hmm. ran on to the influx of Pentecostal 
Christianity into those regions where people interpreted, they were told by their, by their preachers that uh, UFOs were from the devil and it was Satan or something wicked out there. And um, so um, um, there were uh, those who believed that, um, um, I, I know I had, uh, I interviewed this one gentleman who, who said uh, they are poison. And when I asked him what he, what he meant, he, he told the tale of, of a, um, the story of a UFO that came over his little cornfield hovered over this tree and this little man gets out of this this uh, spacecraft and he goes and he starts picking the corn doesn't ask them he said if he had asked me i would have given it to him and and what well, he is struggling with the fact that this stranger who he doesn't recognize who looks very strange to him anyway and the way he's dressed is out there stealing his corn and so there's a struggle and they tried to stop him. He and his brother tried to stop him. And then they end up very ill with a rash. And it takes a lot of effort for them to, to recover from this. And they still haven't fully recovered. They still have uh, recurring incidents of, of rashes and weakness and, and uh, um, vomiting and things of that nature. Hmm. Um, but um, to them, they were malevolent. But, um, um, you know, when you, you uh, uh, other people didn't find them so, you know, or, uh, but if you're a young woman, like the young woman that I interviewed in Guatemala, who, what, she and her boyfriend were in the plaza, they were planning on getting married, they were engaged. He did, they decided to leave the plaza and and walk home. And on the way home, the two of them are abducted, and they're very aware of what's going on. Um, they struggle, but they're both taken, and when they get on board the craft, they're separated. And when she they re, are returned home, the next day she feels like she's pregnant. And so she tells her boyfriend, I, I'm, I, and she said, but I'm a virgin, she told me. I was a virgin. I had never had sex. And her boyfriend um, said, well, let's get married immediately because it's a virgin birth. You're like the Mother Mary. So you have that religion coming in as an interpretation of what happened and how it happened not attributing it all to the UFO, but to the fact that something occurred to her that made her have this baby. If if the UFO wasn't from another planet, it was somebody sent from God to make her pregnant. So as they're preparing for their wedding, the UFO returns two months later, and the next day she's no longer pregnant. And so, you know, when you have uh, um, a UFO incident, obviously we've all heard stories of women who claim to have been abducted and who have been impregnated and then the baby taken from them. You've even heard of occurrences where women have been taken on board crafts and said, this is your child. Here's a young woman who hadn't been exposed to any of that literature, goes, is taken on board with her boyfriend. She suddenly realizes that she's pregnant to cover for her because they believe that it's a virgin birth, like Mother Mary, and that God had impregnated her, they decide to marry hmm. so that she wouldn't be criticized in the community. And then the next, in another month or two, the UFO, a UFO reappears over that village, and she's no longer pregnant. So it's so sort of like what you were saying before about, you know, the sort of outsider perception on the experience right. that one, one is experiencing. And I was fully accepting of what she is saying, you know, because I recorded the story just as she told it, because I believe that did happen to her. And one of the other things that, that you will notice in, in uh, 
uh, my second book in, uh, of, of uh, Alien Encounters in Mesoamerica, The Sky People, you'll notice that uh, the descriptions of the craft uh, range in, like a long tubular craft, which is, uh, is often described in UFO literature. Uh, many of them describe it like a long gasoline tank, only bigger, or a long water tank, because that's what they have seen. And they talk about these tanks that are floating around in the sky and, and taking people or landing and taking people. Well, since since this book has come out, um, what has been the reaction with either, you know, the Native American community or even in the UFO community? Have you received any feedback from either of those two groups? Not particularly. Um, you know, I, I've had a few... Uh, uh, different Native American individuals write to me and say, you know, it's it's about time our stories are told, and thank you for doing this. Um, and um, but not uh, and 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 I've been on on you know different shows with some very well known UFO researchers, but um, and they have been they have have liked my work and have praised my work but not as a rule has it uh, you know I don't I don't know if it's not because it's not that well known or or if uh, people are tired of listening to the UFO stories I'm not sure but one mm. thing's for sure if they read these books they'd hear some very different stories than what they've heard before right well Dr. Clark when you were interviewing people did anyone have an amazing story but were really reluctant to tell you at first, and what was many that of them were reluctant to tell tell me. Um, you know, that it wasn't something that they necessarily want to broadcast. And one of the things that I had to assure them is that I would do everything in my power to protect them, their identity, where they were from, who they were, and even to the point where, um, you know, I developed a code system myself so that. Um, you know, although I remember the people, but I, I'll never reveal that, you know, because that's some, that was my sacred promise. And, and my word is, is, is what gave me access to those people. And, you know, in Indian country, your word is still important. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you say you'll, you'll do something and you do it. And, uh, and, you know, so that, um, like, uh, you know, I met, um, I had been at Montana State about a year, and um, a superintendent on a, of the Indian School District called me up and said, you know, we really are in trouble over here, and we wonder if you could come over and help us write a grant. And the university said, well, I think that's fine, you know, go over and see what kind of assistance you can give them, and uh, they had a number of students in their in their school district that w were not fluent in English, but but could speak the native language. And that's what my center was all about. And so I went over to help them out. and And my contact over there uh, on the reservation was a cultural specialist, and um, and he was really upset that I was there. He just said, you know, you're you're you know not even from this tribe, and you know, you've been educated in the white man's schools, and, and you know, you're, um, basically you're not Indian anymore, is what he was saying. Mm -hmm. But over the years, he and I really developed a, a good relationship. I mean, he respected me, and I respected him. And um, uh, I had known him probably 25 years until one morning, he's, one, one night, we, were, we had been working together all day on a plan, uh, for this new grant we were writing, and he looked at me and he said, you collect stories about star people, don't you? And I said, yes. And he said, well, I have a story to tell you unlike any other. And he said, but you're going to have to go with me tomorrow out to my old home place. He said, because you won't understand it unless you see where it happened. And so the next morning he picked me up and he drove me it was about 60 miles from where the school district was, where the town was. 
and out to a remote section of the reservation where his grandfather had um, got his, you know, allotment back in the days when um, the government came in. Uh, they had given reservations. You know, a lot of things happened out here in the West where they 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 gave a tribe a reservation and said and drew a boundary and said, okay, this is where you're going to live. And so people just lived wherever they wanted to live. And it was just kind of accept- accepted. But then um, later the government comes in in the mid-1840s and says, no, that's not going to work. What we want you to do is we want you to identify, uh, you know, like 140 acres of land that you want personally. And that will be your land. And nobody else's land. Well, you know, the Native people weren't used to land ownership. They were mm-hmm. used to, you know, the common common ownership. And, uh, and didn't even own it then because you couldn't own something from Mother Earth. And so... Everybody had to sign up, and if you didn't sign up, then the government signed you up. And um, then after that was done, the government put the remaining land that they had originally designated as reservation land up for sale to non-Indians. So you can go to a lot of the reservations around the West. And what you will find is, even though it's a designated reservation with with reservation lines, inside those lines are all of these white ranches and farms and all sorts of different kinds of things and businesses that are owned by non-Indians and, you know, even police forces and all kinds of operations going on because the government, once they gave the allotment of 144 acres um, to each family, then they just simply... Um, sold the land for 50 cents an acre to anybody who wanted to buy it. And uh, um, I'm not sure how I, wh- why I began. <laughs> I've lost my train of thought now. What mm-hmm. question did you ask me? Well, he was going to tell you about the experience that he had. He took you out there to... Oh, yeah. <laughs> and uh, anyway, so what happened is we go out and it is, I have known him for 25 years, at least. And he said to me, he said, uh, a UFO crashed on my grandfather's land back in 1943. Well, you know, this is before Roswell. And he, can, he said that when he was a boy, his parents both worked in town for the tribe. And so when school, school was out, they would pack him up with a change of clothes and some paperback books and a, and a ball and take him out to his grandfather's place and just leave him. And he would stay there with his grandfather. And his grandfather would tell him stories and teach him things, and he would read stories to his grandfather. And, of course, as he grew older and became a young man, he was able to do a lot of the chores uh, around um uh, the ranch, you know, the cattle and take care of the cattle and horses and all that. And, um, but he said that this one particular summer that he went there, his grandfather took him out. His grandfather's house was located up on a, up on a uh, kind of a cliff overlooking a river. And he said, that's where the UFO crashed. And he said, so the next day they went over. And he has, his grandfather had never been able to explore the craft. And so he went over and climbed up into this craft and went inside it. And he said it was a, a very um, uncluttered, uh, uh, clean, uh, cold atmosphere. He said there were 19 chairs and he sat down on one and he, and he was... He was quite taken with his chair because he said when he sat down, it embraced him and it held him and he was very frightened and was struggling. And then when he just thought, I've got to get out of this chair, how am I going to do this? The chair opened up. So he discovered that if he sat down in the chair, it would close around him. If he wanted to get up, all he had to do was think it and the chair would react. So he said it was almost like it was a a living creature, the spaceship itself. 
he talked about um, um, jars of some kind of liquid that he said when he opened the jar, it's, it smelled like the rotting forest. And he wanted to take one with him, but his grandfather told him, no, that was sacred. That was a part of the, of the star people, and he wasn't allowed to do that. But anyway, the story that his grandfather had told him was how the spacecraft had crashed. And um, at first, um, he, you know, he, he didn't see anyone. And then later, um, uh, he, he, he saw a couple of the survivors, and he began to communicate with them. And I asked him well, how they did that, and he said, well, he didn't know. His grandfather said they talked in his head. Um, his grandfather was quite taken with them. He took it upon himself to protect them after he learned that they had come from a mothership that had gone away to another planet and would return to pick them up in three months. So they really had no means of communication with this mothership. So they were stranded there. And they told him, you know, all we want to do is to... Uh, uh, remain uh, unnoticed for three months, and they will come for us. And so his grandfather, uh, it was his grandfather's land, and so he was very excited about complying and helping them to protect them. The nearest neighbor was four miles away, and even that neighbor had gone away, as I recall, had, was uh, not even there for, the, for this period of time. So the grandfather... Uh, he, he talked about going hunting and bringing them food, and they told him no, they didn't drink that, eat that kind of food. He talked about their their suits that when they waded into the water, that they came out, the suits were still completely dry, and his grandfather wished he could find a suit like that. Um, they talked about his grandfather, uh, where he lived, there were a lot of geodes on his property. And so he showed them the geodes. He would go out and and uh, look for geodes, and he would come back and he would break them open and show them these marvelous little crystal cities on the inside of these geodes. And so he would, um, uh, they were, they just loved these geodes. So if his grandfather, if he had some spare time, would go out and look for geodes and give them to them, which they, he said, had added to their collection. And um, in a three-month period. Um, the mothership returned, and they were rescued, and they went away. And um, a couple years later, uh, the young man goes out. He's now, you know, about 11 or 12 years old. He goes out to spend the summer with his grandfather, and his grandfather is just frantic. And he has been told that he has to leave his home. And he has to go and stay in town, and that they will pay, they will pay for his lodging and his meals, but he has to move because the Corps of Engineers is going to build a dam, and they are going to blow up the countryside, and and um, um, it, it's unsafe for him to live there. And he said uh, his grandfather was so upset because you know he had horses and cattle and and. Uh, he got his horses and cattle to a to a pasture um, a, a few miles away from where they were blasting, and um, and you know out there in that country it's open range, so you don't have any idea where your cattle are going, and and you know you just round them up in the fall, you know the general idea of where they should be, and um, the next uh, when they were allowed to return. Um, the area where the craft had had uh, had crashed and had gone into the the mountain, um, it was leveled and underwater. When this dam, the grandfather was convinced they found the spacecraft and took it away, because uh, after he returned, uh, some of the government men, he said came to his place and asked him if strange things happened out there. And he said that, you know, he totally uh, feigned ignorance because he was sure they were asking about that spacecraft 
and he mm-hmm. wasn't about to tell them anything. And he said that, um, I said, well, how would they get something out of there? Uh, and he said, well, you know, he said this is in a day before when cars were even something that people would stand along the side of the road to see go by. And he said they could have carried anything out of here. I know would have known what it was. He said, I remember when they were bringing equipment in, how people would line the highways. He said, all you'd have to do is put it on a flatbed truck and throw some some tarps over it. Nobody would know. They'd be more interested in the truck that was going by. So it took him 25 years to tell me that story. A story that, you know, uh, I mean, is is amazing in terms of the history of the UFOs mm-hmm. because of the timeline when it occurred. Well, Dr. Clark, speaking of timeline, you know, a lot of people in, in the UFO community, they've got a lot of different theories as to what extraterrestrials are. And some people do believe that they're from the future, that it's actually us coming back, have you found any Native Americans that kind of believe the same thing, that it, it, it's no. us returning from the future? Not at all. Uh, in, in, uh, down in my country, uh, I would hear them say, you know, um, um, and you find this in South America with a lot of the tribes, too. They don't have a separate word for for aliens and and uh, um um, humans, they say they're us. They're they're us. They have the same word. They use the same word. So, um, and um, you know, and I talked to some of the Maya elders. They told me, you know, uh, no, the ancient astronaut theory, you know, we, is is ridiculous. You know, we came here, we liked what we saw, and we stayed. And so, you know, I said, well. You, then the ancient astronaut theory, which, you know, is ethnocentric to begin with, but basically it says that, you know, these superior beings from another world came to Mother Earth and and um, and uh, enslaved the Maya or coerced them in some way to build these cities, and they had all this technology to move all these boulders, you know, giving no credit to to the Maya, that they were capable of such an event, because the Maya that they encountered thousands of years later were people who lived in the jungle as people had lived centuries ago. And when I talked to the the Maya elders about that, they said, well, you know, we want you to think in terms of, say, for example, if a catastrophic event would happen to the USA. And the, and it is leveled. And years from now, 3,000 years from now, these archaeologists will come into the USA and they will begin to dig. And just imagine that they start digging in New York City. And when they find the Statue of Liberty, they'll probably say she was the goddess of flame that the people worshipped. <laughs> And he said, you have all kinds of gods in New York City, all these statues around that people will, uh, that archaeologists will probably identify as somebody, because there won't be any written record. All that will be destroyed. So they will have to assume from their perspective what this civilization did and who they were and what they ate and why nobody put up resistance and why none of them survive. But he said, we did survive. And today, you know, it, it's believed that one of the, what happened to the, that, that the Maya abandoned um, those cities in the jungle was because of a hundred year drought. And they simply left the cities because you're talking about cities that had a hundred thousand people in them. That they, uh, left in small family groups, went into the jungle, and so they could survive. You know, he said, he, he was telling me, he said, you know, you just think of, a, you know, what your options are. Well, you know, if a ca- catastrophe happens that threatens every living person in a society, what do you do? You make a decision that you want your family to survive. 
and you can survive yourself because you know how to plant crops. You know which trees bear uh, good fruit. You know what the medicines are. So you take your family and you go and see, you know, if if you – and another uh, uh, elder was telling me, he said, you know, we weren't like the Aztecs. When Cortez and the Spaniards, he called them the invaders, came here, he said, the Aztecs thought their gods had returned. Mm-hmm. And they were such an advanced civilization that they just mesmerized the Aztecs. He said, but we came ourselves from an advanced civilization. And the Spaniards were not advanced. We were the ones from an advanced civilization. We weren't waiting for our God to return because we brought our knowledge with us when we arrived on this earth. And, you know, if you if you look at the history of the Maya, they really are a group of people who do not say that somebody appeared in the heavens and gave them all their great knowledge or somebody came to visit them from the east. They simply arrive in Mesoamerica and their knowledge, they already have that knowledge. And so they weren't waiting for anybody to come, like the Aztec. And therefore, they were not vulnerable to capture. Uh, and it was only after Cortez, back, you know, in, in, uh, uh, had, had left 100 years later, that you have the Catholic Church coming in, and a man by the name of Landa, who, um, because the Mayans would not... Uh, convert to the Christianity, anybody who wouldn't convert, he started putting to death and burned all of the, you know, the Maya had a tremendous, uh, it kept tremendous records of their history and their knowledge in what was called codices, and he burned them, uh, piled them all up and and, uh, and burned them, and burned all of their, uh, their religious uh, um, uh, symbols and uh, and and only three of those survived, and none of them are in Mexico, and and but they have given us insight to a certain degree of what the Maya civilization was like. But the people today in in Mesoamerica, the Maya are still you know, for most part, living in those small villages, living the way their ancestors did thousands of years ago. Well, Dr. Clark, do you do you believe that there are star people that are living among us right now, uh, maybe sort of um, interceding in some sort of, you know, human aspects of the world, control or whatever it may be? Do, do you or, or do the Native Americans believe that, that we are amongst the star people? Well, I heard that. Um, um, I met a, a, um, an Indian elder who told me that um, aliens were being brought to Earth. And he had seen that at his place, that they were being brought to Earth. And he felt they were being scattered throughout, but he didn't see that as a positive thing, as a helpful thing. He saw it more as an invasive thing. And he was very concerned about it. Um, On the other hand, I met a Maya elder in Guatemala who told me that um, the star people come every 16 years, and then they're gone for 16 years. And he said they can assume any identity they want to assume, so they can be your next-door neighbor, and you wouldn't know the difference. But he said they they come, they help scientists, they help researchers, they help government leaders, and give them the tools and the information they need to improve society. But then when they leave, it takes them 16 years to get home, and then the next group starts toward the Mother Earth. And and so you have that lap. And he said the next time they will come will be in the year 2016. Hmm. So I, I did run on to those two different versions of what the aliens were doing here. And I, you know, in in the book I'm writing now, I met a, I met a man that uh, observed uh, mining going on 
or testing soils and taking samples and stuff. I was extremely concerned that there is an alien group out there that's very interested in the minerals of our planet. And he says, we know what happens when a group of people want the minerals. Look what the gold rush people did right. to anybody in their way, including Indian tribes. They destroyed them. Mm-hmm. And he said, you know, I think we have to be very concerned that not all the people out there or not all the beings out there. And, and, uh, and he says, I wonder if we're able to do anything about it because they have such advanced technology. So he was very concerned about that. I mean, he saw them going into an ancient or to an abandoned mine and how long it had been. And he said that, and then he went over another hill and there was another UFO and they had some kind of an extension and they were drilling core samples. So he has a little team down there uh, in New Mexico that um, they're like the neighborhood watch. Hmm. And uh, they watch the skies and follow all of these, these uh, all of them are Vietnam veterans. And uh, they're very concerned. So it, I think that it all um, depends on what kind of an interaction you had. Well, you know, Dr. Clark, Anthony and I, we always talk about the idea in theory that paranormal phenomena, all of it, has this invisible thread that links them together, like Bigfoot, aliens, and ghosts. Now, do you believe that much of the phenomenon that we experience may be all related in some way or another, or do you think that there are separate entities and separate experiences? Well, uh, I believe ghosts and star children are something separate from uh, alien encounters and UFO Mm -hmm. sightings. Um, A star child, as I understand it, is supposed to be someone born of a human mother who perhaps, you know, has some kind of blood or some kind of a uh, connection with the cosmos. The people I interviewed weren't talking about those kind of individuals. The um, uh, ghosts, no. Uh, But Bigfoot... I ran on to, you know, I didn't I purposely set out to collect Bigfoot stories because, um, you know, I mean, I came from a region of the country where all kinds of critters were supposed to be out there in, in the mountains, you know, and you heard all kinds of stories and all kinds of legends. Uh, you never knew what was true and what wasn't true. Um, but um, I think that... Um, um, When I was in Guatemala, my driver had told me this story about it. He said, you know, giants still roam the jungles here. And I said, well, you know, you mean you're talking about legends, right? And he said, oh, no, they, they you know, they they still roam the jungle and they have, um, uh, you know, these white tigers are their companions and and they they can bite off a man's head, he said, and spit it out like watermelon seed and he says and once they bite off your head they own your soul well see now you've got a legend that's intermingled with you know a superstition mm-hmm. and then he takes me up you know he dry, he pulls up along the side of the highway and he stops the van parks the van and tells me that he has to go to his village because he forgot his license and here I am stuck on the top of a mountain in the middle of a jungle by myself and I said to him I said can I go with you and he said oh no it's it's too treacherous and it's too steep he says you're gonna have to wait here I'll be back in 30 minutes he said so I'm sitting there trying to figure out what on earth I'm going to do uh, he gave me the keys, and I thought, well, I could drive away. I don't know how far I would get, but I, I, could, I could do that. Or I could wait 30 minutes and see if he comes back. So I, I get get my notebook and my tape recorder, and I go sit on the shady side of the van, and all of a sudden I hear these horses coming up the road. 
and I sneak a peek at what I see, and I see this elderly gentleman astride a horse. He's got a um, um, machete swinging at his side. He's got a gun across his saddle. He's got um, bullets wrapped in revolutionary-style uh, band <laughs> around his, his body. And uh, I thought, well, you know, I, I don't think he's a threat to me. So I, I, I greet him. And he greets me, and he gets down, and he, he lets his horse rest. And I give him water, and and we began to talk. And, and I asked him, I said, do you speak Spanish? Uh, he spoke a little. He told me that he, he spoke the dialect, actually, that my driver, my driver, uh, but he had been in the U.S., back when he was handsome, he said. But he was so lonely here that he just left there and he came back and he never left his village. He loved the Cisco kid and Poncho. So he would say, Oh Cisco <laughs> <laughs> And you know and it was just it was just a, a he was just a delightful, wonderful human being. And um he would um I asked him uh, if he, uh, we were able to communicate, at least on a limited basis, and I asked him about the the giants. I said, do the giants still live here? And then he begins to tell me about the giants, and he says that there are giants that live in, in the, in, 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 and they don't allow their women to go out at night. He said, even the men will not be out in the jungle at night because of the giants. And he said, now they're not the hairy kind. We have the hairy kind, he says, but they're not the hairy kind. So then, you know, we use different kinds of means of trying to determine, but the hairy kind, according to him, were like Bigfoot in the U.S. And he said that, but they're not the hairy kind. The hairy kind um, uh, uh, also live here, but but they're different. And he begins to tell me that um, they... uh, the the giants who live there are are uh, uh, known to steal women and children, and so they protect their women and children. And I said, well, do they ever come into the village? No, they never came into the village. But he says, I think they're from up there. And he pointed to the sky. And I said, well, why do you think that? And he says, well, because when when the UFOs come around uh, and they they land. And we can hear them running through the jungle and crying because they're being pursued by um, uh, these beings that come come from space, he said. And I said, have you seen this? Oh, yes, he had seen it. And it was very frightening for the village. And uh, and so that is, you know, an, an account that I've heard where there was a connection um with uh, a giant hairy person, and um, but not of the Bigfoot type. Uh, there was a distinction there that that uh, um, that he had, um, you know. That but they came from the sky. They were controlled by the people from the sky. Hmm. You know, Dr. Clark, Lucy and I have done this show for several years, and uh, we, you know, we've had many, many guests on, and we've talked to tons and tons of people, even in our own sort of private investigations when not sure. on the air. And you know, we've—I I, I think I could speak for Lucy as well. Um, we're finding that people are so much more interested when you talk about the paranormal aspects and when you talk about ufology and aliens and extraterrestrials and star people, um, people are so much more interested when you bring up Native American culture and when you start to delve into the history of of the Native American side of this and and, um, their thoughts and their theories. what makes it, in your opinion, what makes it so interesting for people to learn about the Native American culture uh, and what they think about the paranormal and, and spiritual phenomena? Well, I think that, that people as a rule look at, at, the, at the, the ancient beliefs of Native people as being uh, untouched. 
hmm. by modern society, that they are uncorrupted, and that when the people tell those stories, they have basis in the truth. Therefore, if they have stories of star people, there must be some truth in it, that they must exist. And I think that's why, why you have that interest in a Native American perspective. Well, you know what, Dr. Clark, I really, really enjoyed reading your first book, Encounters with Star People, The Untold Stories of American Indians, and I can't wait to finish the second one. And to me, it was very interesting to learn about all the different connections and experiences. So I want to ask you, is there something that you wish your readers will take after reading your books that they'll get the meaning behind the stories out there? Well, you know that um, I, I hope they will recognize that our cultures are very old and that um, the stories that that they are they tell and the stories that have been passed on from generations to generations are stories of the history of the people. You know, it, it, and there was a time in our history when it was just not Native Americans who had the stories, but so did all groups of people on the planet have their stories that they taught to their children. But as um, things progressed and, and uh, um, let's face it, the, the white people were the ones in control of, of science and the advancement of science, um, the native people stay closer to the earth, their their belief that they were to protect the earth. And so you have, growing out of that renaissance and out of that industrial age, the, the total disregard and loss of oral history. If it wasn't something that could be explained by orthodox science, it wasn't worthy of even repeating. So the people who are not indigenous, so to speak, simply let those stories go. I believe that every group on this planet had their stories, but they lost them. Where Native Americans who were isolated once they were conquered, or the Maya who went into the jungles, and the, and and you know, and you find that all throughout South America as well. Those people held on to their stories. They didn't care what anybody else said and for most part they were isolated away from the white populations anyway so the they continued to tell their stories and they continued to tell their stories of modern history they still i mean they tell stories of of battles they tell stories of what happened uh, i mean contemporary stories so you have that oral history that's alive and well but in the non-indigenous societies, you don't see that. People rely on scientists to explain the universe. They rely on scientists to, you know, for the medicine they take, for everything. Where native people haven't done that, they still. And, and of course, it, it, it depends on the degree. I mean, you still have native people who are very much into contemporary things. And unfortunately, satellite TV has done a lot to destroy that as well among the young people on reservations because I, I remember when I first came to Montana, there, there was no television. You know, I mean, you you go on a reservation and people listen to the radio if they could get it. And sometimes they couldn't get it until midnight and then, then they didn't. And some faraway station in Texas or somewhere that had one of these massive towers, I guess. But the kids there, you know, they didn't know about all these uh, these toys and all these things. They didn't know they were they were considered disadvantaged or poor. They didn't know any of this stuff. And then the satellite TV comes along, and in the early days, it was totally uncensored so anybody that could put a satellite up in there there was no charge for for stations i don't know if you guys remember that or not but you just put a satellite up in your backyard so they saw you know the all the 
pornography stations that today you you pay for. I mean, all those are right out there for people to watch. And the Hmm. children watched them because they didn't know any better. And the parents, you know, are just so astounded by all this opportunity. I mean, this, uh, I mean, all, all this opportunity to see what's going on in the world. But it changed. It changed a lot. And so now the elders, they worry about what's going to, you know, future generations. But you do have, on every reservation, it seems like, a group of young people who have banded together and have vowed to keep those old ways and, uh, and to pass them on to their children. So hopefully there will always be that group. Um, I have a young nephew that, that uh, you know, he's a, he's a Sundance man, and, and he's, you know, into his, his fifth year of, of the Sundance, and, you know, he, uh, when I, I call and I say, well, what are you doing today? And he'll say, well, I'm helping so-and-so put a roof on their house. He doesn't get paid for those things, but it's his responsibility, he believes, to to look out for people, uh, the elderly, uh, the people who can't do everything for themselves. So, you know, he he absolutely adheres to that philosophy um, uh, where he's got a brother who's very much involved in, you know, cell phones and computers and, and all that kind of stuff he rejects it um and has you know a, a real sense of spirituality that is is different from um uh, a lot of the kids on the reservation today well dr clark we want to thank you again for coming on the show tonight I think we Oh, you're right welcome. I this. loved it. I, we didn't get to talk too much about the book. Um, <laughs> but I do <laughs> I do hope people will um you know, uh I you know, the second book is a lot different from the first book. Uh but I would love to hear from it, your your listeners out there. Uh, they want to talk to me about the book. Uh um you know, I have a website, uh sixkiller.com. And they can reach me through that website, uh, Artie at sixkiller dot com. And uh, I don't have a staff, so I read and answer all my e- emails. So I hope that they will get in touch with me if they have questions. That's wonderful. You know what, everybody? Please check out Dr. Clark's website. It's sixkiller dot com. Go to amazon dot com to pick up more of her interesting works. Dr. Clark, thank you so much. It's been an honor and a true pleasure to have you on the well, show. Thank you, Lucy. I've really appreciated it. And you too, Anthony, up there in New York. <laughs> thank you so much, Dr. Clark. I know you're going to get some of this cold Montana weather. It's headed your way. <laughs> yeah, we are. We just got a snowfall today, but Lucy, I think, is in the negative degree weather. Yeah, we're 12. Yeah, I think we're we're we were at a high of twelve and a low of four. I think we're predicted. But last week we had twenty six below, and that is cold. <laughs> that's beach weather, right? <laughs> right. When it gets forty, that's when it's beach weather in Montana. <laughs> <laughs> well, Dr. thank you Clark, so much, Doctor Clark. So much. Oh, thank you. You have a great year. You too. You have too. a great night. Bye bye. Okay, bye-bye. So what did you think? I loved it. I loved it. I can't stop smiling. You know what? I read the first book cover to cover, and exactly what she said. I mean, that was the one thing. And we kind of talked about this a little bit, you know, like believing the stories that were told. There is this sense in the Native American way of thinking, you know, that you when you just relate what you see or what what you know. And there's no making things up and there's no sense of, of you know, trying to be sensational. It's simply relating. I mean, it, it goes back to, like, the tradition of oral history. And that's what's really, really different from Native American culture as, Modern, you know, other cultures, and I'm sure 
and it's kind of weird because I've got like both sides. I've got like the Mexican side, which is the the Mesoamerican, and then I've got the Native American side. And I can, you know, some of the things that she mentioned, I totally can understand. I understand the Native side, and I understand the stories. And she did, you know, she mentioned about the the blue people, and basically what that is is that. Um, the Cherokee, we believe that there is a race of little blue people that live under the earth, and they come out, they come out at night, and they tend gardens, and they do all this stuff, but they're little blue people with big eyes, and when you look at what the description is, they're aliens, you know, and it's not a matter of like, you know, maybe, you know, to some people it can seem like a legend, but to a Native American, you believe because these are the stories. This is how history is passed on in Native American culture. It is oral tradition. Um, I know you were talking about a little bit before, you know, like the scientific, you know, okay, so we need proof. And I'm kind of like at that point in my life where, yes, I want answers and I want proof. But then there's a Native American side of me that accepts and I understand. I it's hard to explain. It's almost like a feeling. It's almost like this in, innate knowledge that you just know. You just know. And when I was reading the book, it was like, yeah, you know, I, I, I believe what these people are relating. I believe that this is their experience. Is that like the Blue Man Group out in Vegas? <laughs> Except they're a lot shorter and they got bigger eyes. <laughs> and they don't play music, right, on the drums? No. No, they don't. Um, no. Um, well, you know, it was interesting because during the conversation with Dr. Clark, um, her and I had touched on the topic of perception. And it. Uh, I think she was talking about the two, difference of, two differences of qualifications for research. And the one was basically it's, you know, someone's perception or outside influence on a thought or theory or experience and something sort of uh, interacting with it and creating something completely different. Now, when you talk about perception, my perception of an experience can be completely different than what you experience. You know, we could be standing side by side and something streaks across the sky I'll think it's a meteor, you think it's a falling star. Uh, you know, the third person behind us may think it's a UFO. So it's all about how you were perceiving it based on the environment that, first of all, the environment that you've grown up in, the thought perception and the thought ideas and the ideology that you've kept all along creates that experience in you and, and creates the formulation of that experience, I should say. So... Um, Perception has a lot to do with it, and you know, it's it's not. I don't want to say that I don't believe in any Native American story, uh, paranormal and supernatural at all. Uh, I'm not saying that at all. I think it's a matter of, um, in my opinion, it's trying to find out not what something is if it's something is believable or not. It's more so, well, what's the circumstances behind that and surrounding that experience? So, for instance, if somebody's claiming that there's a, a UFO that had crashed, you know, I think you first would believe it because, if, and it's coming from a Native American, you first would believe it because that's your ideology. That's the way that you have been taught and grown up with and, and been surrounded by people of that nature that did that. Um, and... Many other folks would say, well, how did it and why did it and do you have any proof? Is, you know, let me see the land. Does the land look disturbed? Are there any artifacts that you've found, any, any you know, pictures or video, whatever it may be? Um, and I know that, that uh, Dr. Clark's idea in that is sort of bringing in science and that there's really no need to bring in that science when you talk about Native American experiences in history and talks about paranormal uh, that you don't need to because they've only known one way of speaking and that is the truth and that is to be honest. Um, and I'm not saying, and I don't think anybody is being dishonest at all. I think it's just a matter of, you know, how, how they've perceived an experience and how they have perceived the situation at hand. You know, uh, I, I 
in 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 the way that I think, um, you know, if you have two different Native American cultures standing side by side, like just like the scenario I mentioned earlier, I think the two of them would have two different experiences and explain it differently. Um, mm-hmm. That's not to say that either one of them are false in in their um, you know in 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 their engagement in what has actually happened in front of them. I think it's a little bit of spiritual, a little bit of family background, a little bit of their knowledge. Um, I think it has all of these different aspects that create what that experience is and is being told that way. And so, in in my opinion, bringing in the science, to some may feel as though it's being intrusive, but to me it's sort of, well, let's negate some of the things that, if we're if we're on this path of finding truth, let's negate some of the things that or low-hanging fruit that you can say, well, okay, that's probably not what happened because of X, Y, and Z, because of factual instances. And then I can get to the root of this story and find out for myself, not whether or not it's believable, but whether or not um, certain aspects may or may not have happened, but the gist of it the idea of that experience, I believe, could still well have been played out right in front of them. Well, okay. It kind of clicked for me when she was talking about it because this even crosses over into, like, when we paranormal investigate. You are the one that always looks for, like, you know, the the proof. The You analyze everything. Where me, I'm a lot more accepting, you know, I just, like, oh, wow, you know, that that is paranormal it's a spirit you know i i have a tendency to like accept what i'm experiencing as what it is but i'm learning from you the scientific side in which i really really i'm grateful for that you know it's kind of giving me the the opportunity to look at things from a factual scientific side as opposed to the part of me that says, yes, oh, that's a spirit. Oh, yes, that's that. And I'm kind of learning to meld the two together. But I know where it comes from now. It comes from that Native American way of thinking. My acceptance of a lot of the paranormal and the things that I experience, I I have a tendency to take it as paranormal. It, it's a ghost. It's a spirit. It is something. But when I'm learning from you, and the way that you perceive things, you're looking for the data that proves what it is. You want to take out all of the things that it isn't before you accept that it is. Not necessarily. It makes sense, but not necessarily. I mean, I'm uh, 20% like you, uh, you know, where... uh, I can I can feel it I can sense it and you know that uh, I, you know mm-hmm. I, I I have that I think it I can if I want to put a label on it or a number I'd say it's twenty percent of me I feel that way the other eighty percent is the more investigative part of my brain that that clicks on and I just want to clarify it's not a matter of determining whether or not something is extraterrestrial or ghostly or paranormal. Um, or supernatural or anything like that. It's not to determine whether or not it is or it isn't. It's a matter of, and this is going back to when we were talking to Dr. Clark and the question that I asked about malevolent and benevolence, whether or not their experiences, if if she found that they were either malevolent or benevolent, these star people. And she said that she had heard both sides of the coin, basically. Some were, in their interpretation of it, were malevolent. Um, and others were saying that they, they they did not have that experience. And what I'm trying to say is I want to try and negate whether or not it's malevolent or benevolent so that I can get to the heart, the root of the actual experience itself and learn from that. I believe the story, but I don't I don't want to have the perceptions or the the accessories that people put on stories that um, dress it up, that makes it possibly sway in a different way. I want to get rid of those, and that's where the science comes in with me, so that I can say, 
okay, well, it wasn't malevolent, it wasn't a bad spirit, or it wasn't a bad alien or extraterrestrial. They were good. It was just a matter of, and it was mentioned before in chat, they were talking about it, maybe they got a rash because of the radiation from the UFO itself. So it wasn't that the, the being was malevolent. Their, their reaction, their bodily, physical reaction to being there in the presence of a UFO created those rashes on, on them. And so if that was all of that story, I can honestly say then that story is not malevolent. That wasn't a bad alien if that was true. So now I want to push that aside and now get to the real story of, okay, this, this UFO came down, this being came out and was picking crops. You know, why were they picking crops? That's what I want to learn and get into and put aside all of that sort of accessory type of, of descriptions. Well, and I found it interesting because, like, even, like, the Mexican side of me, I totally agree with her. The 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 Latin side, there's definitely more superstition. There's definitely more... Um, things like that involved when you're when you're talking about the paranormal. And one thing that, that really um clicked with me, I don't know if you've seen these videos on YouTube of like the um UFO that's kinda like it flies over and then it goes into um the volcano in Mexico City. Um mm -hmm. it's called Popo de I can't even say it. But the description that this person that, that this gentleman was giving the long tube like um UFO, that's pretty much what you're seeing in these videos. You're seeing like this long silver tube that's flying over the volcano and disappearing inside of it. And I just thought that was interesting. I mean it it's like, okay, here you have someone who's describing basically the same thing. And now I can go on YouTube and I can actually see something that looks very, very similar. Something that looks like that. I mean, so yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm seeing all these connections and all of these things that are kind of like adding up. It, it, it's just totally fascinating. I mean, both books, and, you know, and I will be honest, I didn't finish the second book. The first book was just really, to me, just, it was fascinating. It was absolutely fascinating. I mean, I've read it twice. And those stories, what people talk about, they're I mentioned it to Dr. Clark. I mean, when they're relating these stories, there's this absence of fear. It's almost like just relating, you know, we played football the other day or, or we went shopping the other day. I mean, it's just told in this, like, matter-of-fact way. And it it doesn't have this fear that where other UFO encounters with non-Native people, there's some, a lot of times there's that sense of fear, you know, that sense of the unknown. But for some reason, for the Native people, there's no fear there. You know, it's just an acceptance. Well, we talked about also the idea of, and that was my question to her about these star people, um, or aliens, extraterrestrials, however you want to call them, intermingling and uh, being amongst us humans here on Earth and, and uh, her thoughts and theories on that. And, and again, I think she had sort of... Um, two sides uh, or two opinions on that and uh, some of the people that she had spoken to had mentioned to her that uh, they were very afraid that they were actually integrating uh, within the human race and uh, either it be in agriculture with farming or anything like that. I'm curious to find out if it's actually gone even further than that. Um, and, you know, people are probably going to call me crazy, but it's just a question of whether or not they're actually infiltrating into government agencies and, you know, higher levels of within the government and political structures that are creating or, dare I say, forcing a change in the country or even the world itself and possibly making it seem as though we're creating our own demise. You know, instead of the idea of, um, you know, the war of the, the old War of the Worlds movie where they come down and they just start shooting rays at us and, and taking us up and, you know, obliterating the human race, what if they're coming in sort of, you know, the back door and being conniving and actually creating wars and 
creating this famine and creating all of this for the destruction of the human race will go out on its own and they can quietly come out and take over the land. I know I'm, I'm this big conspiracy theorist right now, but it's a thought to think about. Uh, you know, if you do believe in UFOs and aliens, it's an idea and a concept that many people have brought forward that have said that, you know, and you've heard all the stories about these reptilians and uh, Pleiades, planet, and all of that other stuff, and people coming down and taking on human form and and, and uh, creating this havoc amongst us, so therefore the human race dies out and they can take over the planet. Um, if they have higher intelligence, I wouldn't put it past them. That's a pretty smart way of doing things. Uh, it may take longer, but I think it's a smart way of getting the job accomplished or setting their goal. So um, I thought that that may be something that uh, could be of an interest in the ideas and the stories that are out there. And to figure out and to talk to, I'd be interested to talk to Native Americans who I'm sure have had stories like that where they have known these star people being among them. And, and I think Dr. Clark had mentioned that it was like every 16 years that they come back and, and do this. Uh, and I guess it's because of the flight and everything back and forth. Uh, I'm not sure. Again, that's one of those things where the investigative part of me says, how do you know that? How do you know those years? How do you know, you know, uh, unless there's something that these star people have said to them, how do you know that that's, for that to be true, that they come every 16 years. But I guess it comes with talking to all of the Native Americans and finding their stories that she has gained a better knowledge than me or a lot of other people have to to make that determination uh, of its truthfulness. So um, I understand the idea and the concept of it. Um, but it intrigues me further enough to actually investigate it even more and not sound crazy or a big conspiracy theorist. Well, didn't you mention that they're supposed to come back in 2016? That That's yeah. the election year. So, I mean, I find that interesting. You come back. So we'll have an alien for a president? Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, there is... Um, there is one one belief that Native Americans have that we are related to the star people, that Native Americans are related to the aliens. So, you know, who knows? But I do find it interesting. I do understand how difficult it could have been for her to get these stories because there is a great distrust um, of people that are not Native. I mean, when you're talking about um, people, Native culture relating their stories and a lot of time outsiders don't hear it a lot of times outsiders don't get those stories so for her to be able to interview um a lot of people in different tribes to me that that's an accomplishment because you don't usually get that um there's this sense of distrust and it only stems from a lot of the things that have happened in in our history here in this country so I, I I just really, really enjoyed it. I mean, I, I enjoyed hearing the stories. I mean, basically, that's what Native American culture is. It's, it's storytelling. It's oral history. It's, it's hearing the elders relate stories, and then the young ones take that, and then in turn, when they become older, they relate it. So this, for me, this show was very, very... It was wonderful, and I can't stop smiling because I totally enjoyed this. But, you know, what, what still keeps popping in my head every time I think about this topic, and we've spoke about this before, um, you know, within the Native American culture, and you've seen this all throughout, they have given and they give human characteristics to to nature as a way mm -hmm. of relating to it and as a way of creating a connection spiritually. And so, you know, you have characteristics in animals and uh, in, in nature itself that create or create a persona <clears throat> or personification of something spiritual or human, human-like. And so, 
that is still rumbling through my head when people talk about Native American stories of star people. And it's that question mark still in the back of my head, well, are they doing that with the star people? Are they creating these human type of characteristics or personality traits within, let's just say, the universe, the stars itself, and creating a, you know, the North Star, it's the brightest star, right? What if they've created that as these star people? And, uh, you know, we've talked about this on another show, too, and I can't remember what the show was about, but we talked about how there could possibly be, you know, because, you know, you, you, you smoke the pipe and, um, you know, those herbs can be very dangerous and very hallucinogenic <laughs> that, you know, as as people are gazing up in the sky, because you don't have television, you don't have anything, you know, hundreds and hundreds of years ago that hallucinations created as well. And, you know, I've heard many traditions, Native American traditions that go into caves and do this as a ritual. They go in and, and they, they have, they drink this whatever, or they smoke this whatever, and they come out with these stories. And, uh, you know, I, I'm not trying to make fun and I'm not trying to negate all, uh, you know, Native American stories. I hope everybody gets that. But it, it, that is still sticking in my head when I'm trying to comprehend the stories of star people from Native Americans. And, and I do that with not just Native Americans, but I do that with the everyday Joe who says that they got abducted by an alien. Well, what were you doing, you know, 10 minutes before that? Or how long have you been on the crack pipe? Or, you know, are you an alcoholic? You know, I, like I, I take those things, and those are the things that, I, again, is that investigative nature in me, and question them and try and figure out whether or not that that had anything to do with it. So I'm just playing devil's advocate, and I'm just trying to figure out it all and try and negate the questions that I have so that I can understand things a little bit better and not be believable right off the bat, you know? So you're trying to say that we're high when we see these things. <laughs> no. Not everybody's, not everybody's de delving into the rabbit tobacco, Okay. Um, I, Not everybody, I, I, but a I good amount. I understand what you're saying. I mean, there are there are rituals and there are things that you know, shaman and everything. You know, they they take the mind altering substance or whatever, and so it, it, it opens up. You know, the third right, eye right, and it's supposed to it, right, and the, the meaning of it is supposed to uplift you and bring you higher into that spiritual realm, so that you can speak with and be amongst the quote-unquote gods that they ha had mm -hmm. and, and mm -hmm. to be amongst them and be around them. And they believe that these herbs and these traditions did that for them. And so, mm -hmm. I, I'm, again, I'm just trying, I'm pulling that out and I'm saying, does that have any effect on these stories of star people? Or have that ever ha Has that ever happened before? Um, and then creating that oral history is just being passed down. So that story now is just being passed down from generation to generation within the Native American culture. And it's being believed because you're saying, oh, that was my great-great-grandfather that said that. So of course you're going to believe it. Um, but I just have that in my head. And, you know, I, I don't know if it's just the stubbornness in me, but I, I keep that rumbling all around all the time when I hear stories and I try and figure out, well, did that have anything to do with it? And if I can negate it, great. Then, I, again, then I can get to the heart of that story and learn a little bit more. Well, I understand where you're coming from, and I, I, I do get that point of part of it. But I don't know, reading these stories, I mean, a lot of them came from just like people in everyday life, you know, the, the situation or the, the, the situation where the the encounter came about wasn't one where, it was highly unlikely that that person would have been delving into something, you know, smoking or, or, or taking something. Right, and, and to be fair, I just want to say, too, to be fair, uh, I believe most of the stories, if not all of the stories that uh, Dr. Clark has in her book, are uh, stories that have happened within the last 20, 30 years. So I'm not talking, mm -hmm. I, I don't believe her stories have happened hundreds and hundreds of years ago. Uh, they may have ref reflected upon stories of, 
of the witness's great-great-grandfather, but most of the stories that are in her book have been taken from 20, 30 years ago. So, you know, I, I'm not saying that they weren't smoking the crack, but, you know, the idea of this, you know, herbal r- ritual and all that stuff probably did not happen in those stories. Um, and so I'd, I'd want to try and delve into, try and find out if there was anything else and how that that perception led to the story, their experience. Look, I get that. But, you know, like you mentioned about, like, you know, giving giving uh, things traits, you know, like as far as like in nature, you know, we give them human characteristics. But when you when you look at other stories, other stories about encounters, you know, outside of the Native American culture, we do have a lot of these things come up. You know, they do have human characteristics. They do have the big eyes or, or you know, the body shape, you know, they're shaped like us or they look like us. So I think that crosses all boundary lines, you know, as far as what they look like. You know, they don't all look like the aliens from, from War of the Worlds or they don't all look like, um, you know, aliens. Yeah, or E.T. But I think that crosses cultural lines. I think that that's in every encounter story, you know, or not in every, but I mean in most of them where we have the human characteristics and, you know, the little blue people, that's the only one that I can really talk about because those are the stories that I've heard. And, of course, they have the big the big eyes and they're small and they're little, but the difference is, is that they're blue, you know, and, and they live underground because they can't tolerate the sunlight. She mentioned, you know, the, this one, the, the man in, in South America that, that talked about the big, the giants, you know, the hairy people. Um, Bigfoot, you know, we talk about Bigfoot and some people believe that, you know, it's interdimensional, that he comes from, from you know, that he can hop in and out of portals and stuff. So that kind of lends towards the UFO stories, that that kind of lends towards the idea that maybe Bigfoot is not just something that's grown here on Earth, that where did it come from? You know, if it's coming from a different dimension, how does it have this capability of doing that? So here's this thread again that goes from, from one thing to another that kind of mixes it all together. And these experiences, like you said, they are within the last maybe 20, 30 years. So I think the belief part of it may stem from the history and from the stories that people, you know, that Natives believe. But I think the experience itself is unique because it's something that's happening in a modern day and age. You know, we talked about this with also, too, with Aaron Adair when we were uh, going over the um, Ancient Alien show on the History Channel and debunking the, the myths on that. And he got me to thinking uh, about the idea of, you know, if aliens were to be interacting or have been interacting with the human race for centuries, then why is it that we have, for instance, the culture, the Maya culture, as Dr. Clark was talking about, going basically in um, into extinction because of drought. You know, why wasn't it that these star people or these aliens taught us a better agricultural aspect or uh, given us a tool that could have helped us uh, create a better agriculture group or land to help us succeed more. You know, where is that evidence? Where is that in, you know, history, in the history books, talking about a, you know, clear, concise point where it flipped. It's almost like a light switch. And that's what you would have seen if there was an alien interaction. So I throw doubt onto a lot of things. And you know me, I'm a big UFO guy. I... I'm a diehard alien extraterrestrial UFO. I have been since I was a, a little boy. And so um, if not more so than, you know, the ghosts that we talk about. And so I'm throwing more doubt on that topic than I ever have on any other phenomena that we've talked about. And it's only because there are so many different variables, but one of the main things is because I've never really experienced it. So I, I continually 
put doubt on the idea of aliens, of UFOs. Um, I believe that they are, they are in existence. I do. Um, but when people come forward with stories, uh, I don't like to believe everything because then I don't like to be shown that I'm wrong uh, in the end when it's not true. So I put I cast so much doubt on it. But if people start to talk about spirits and ghosts, and I can see a thread in between my experiences and with someone else's, then I'm going to believe it right off the bat. And I don't have to worry about discrediting them or going further and investigating whether or not they took the peace pipe or you know they had smoked the crack or whatever it is. I won't do that because I have experienced it. But I'm at the stage with UFOs and aliens and star people where I still continually do that. I still cast that doubt. So that's one of the, the rough patches that I have to go through until, I don't know, some alien comes down and visits me. Uh, then maybe I will start to be a little bit more believable and more trusting, I guess, of stories that uh, that I hear. Well, you might have come in contact with one already and not known it. You know, maybe it's not time for you to understand it. Maybe it's not time for you to to be made aware of of you know their presence. This this part. Are you of going it, to reveal something on the air right now? <laughs> yes, I'm not from Chicago. <laughs> okay. No, there was. I can tell you this. For instance, there there was an experience that I had over the summer. And um, I have posted this on my Facebook all the time, that <clears throat> pictures of when I go jogging by the marina in my neighborhood, um, I have seen on um, only on one occasion where I would, you know, as I'm out of breath trying to to breathe uh, after, you know, smoke and uh, not smoking, after, see, smoking, <laughs> after running and jogging because I smoke, um, trying to catch my breath, I will put my hands on my hips and look in the sky. They always say, put, bring, you know, put your head up um, so that you can uh, easily breathe better, better and you don't get the hiccups. That's what I've learned. So that's what I, I would do all the time. And there was one time when I actually looked up into the sky. It was during the day. It was like 2 o'clock in the afternoon. And I saw something very shiny in the sky. And um, it really wasn't moving. And uh, I know there there's an airport near me, and it's near that marina. And they don't, their the planes don't fly that high uh, because they're coming in at that point, basically. So this thing was very high in the sky, and I remember seeing it because it was a sunny day, clear, no clouds, but this piece was shining, and it looked like it was glaring sun. And uh, in a matter of two seconds, it was gone. I didn't see it anymore in the sky at all. So I, it wasn't as though it was an airplane that was passing by or up above or whatever. But I never said anything, and I never really delved into it more. Or at this point in, in my life, I don't even believe that that was a UFO. It's just a, hmm, what the hell was that type of deal. And so even in my own experiences, I cast doubt. And I don't, I don't fully believe it until it's, I guess, repetitive or if it's for a longer period of time where I have been able to negate everything else that it could possibly be before I get to that final answer. Mm -hmm. Well, and I've told you about mine, you know, like growing yeah. up, I the, the spaceship or whatever it was that I saw, but at that point in my life, I just took it as, okay, so it's something with lights, you know, it wasn't in the shape of a plane, it wasn't anything that I could rationally explain. And I never really accepted, you know, oh, it's a UFO or anything. But now that I'm learning more about this and now that I'm doing research, I guess I kind of wish that I did know more at the time so I could really see what it was. But right now it's just a distant memory and it's just something that I saw and it was unusual. And it was like, okay, yeah, you know, that's, that's weird. I've never seen that before. And I have no proof. I have no proof that it's a UFO. I have no proof of anything. I just have a memory of something that I saw. And it was saucer shaped and it had lights all over it. And I saw it for a little bit and then it was gone. Never said anything about it until years later when we talked about it. So, I mean, I'm sure there's many of us out there that may have seen something or maybe experienced something. And we don't really 
immediately say, oh, wow, you know, that's a UFO. It's, I'm sure if they, if the star people have been here, I think maybe a lot more of us have come in contact than we realize. But because we don't have the proof and because we don't think about it on a daily basis, we don't really make a big deal out of it. So I, I'm beginning to believe, truly believe that, yes, the star people have been here for quite a long time. And, you know, like you're saying with the Maya, you know, why didn't they show us a better way to to irrigate and keep water? Maybe it wasn't that important to them. You know, maybe to the star people they had another agenda and saving a particular culture just wasn't one of them. You know, we don't know what their, their purpose is. We don't know why they're here. Um, you know, Dr. Clark mentioned, you know, some people believe that they're here, that they want to mine the minerals, you know, and I'm just thinking of like a science fiction movie here, you know. It's like, okay, they're here to drain the earth, you know. They're here to take the resources. And we're not doing such a good job of, of keeping this earth the way it should be. So they're going to let us destroy ourselves we're doing the job for them. You know, we don't have, they don't have to shoot us with the big ray guns. We're doing it ourselves. And once we're annihilated, they've got this whole planet of minerals and whatever they want, and they can just take it. So who knows, you know? Well, that was my theory on the infiltration of aliens and these star people amongst us through the back door, creating this havoc and making us, you know, deplete the Earth's resources. But anyway. Um, well, you know I'm slow. It takes me about 20 minutes to get it. <laughs> I know. Um, but anyway, I, d I did want to thank Dr. Clark for coming on because, uh, and, and I don't want anybody to get the wrong impression of what I had just talked about. Um, I think her work is absolutely fantastic. I think getting these stories out and published and into the hands and the minds of everyday people to learn more about it and to understand it, just like she was saying before that, you know, if, if MUFON, you know, if the UFO, ufology or UFO communities out there would learn more about these types of stories, it may explain a lot more of what they already have on their records. So I think it's, it's great work that she does put this out there, and I'm really interested in her second book, the one that was just published, um, Alien Encounters in Mesoamerica, because it talks about and explaining, you know, in South America uh, of, uh, you know, the tribes down there and relating those stories. And it would be interesting to see what those tribes had experienced and whether or not, again, if that invisible thread aligns with our Native American culture and our non-Native American culture stories and whether or not that they are true. You know, you, there there are so many stories even within um, the European continents that uh, that the similar stories that, you know, even uh, Europe folks and settlers have that are similar to even the Native American stories. So it's interesting to find out whether or not they all are linking up together. And then once you find if there is that link, okay, well, what is it that is actually making that link and what is so special about it? And can you relate it to other phenomena? And that's what we've talked about before, about that that web that lies within everything. And, and I've always come to the conclusion that it's always energy and light. Energy and light has this common source or is the common source within everything. And you hear it all the time within ghostly stories, Bigfoot stories, UFO stories, strange, weird cryptozoology stories. You hear it all the time. And when you sort of go down to the common denominator in all of it, it's mostly energy and light. And if that is the trail and if that's the bridge between all of them, then what is making that up and what is creating all of that? And why is it that way? So it's pretty interesting. Um, and so I did want to thank Dr. Clark for coming on the show and talking to us uh, and bringing us to a better light within uh, the Native American uh, oral histories and the stories of the star people. So I thought it was really interesting. And even though we did only scratch the surface on it, um, I think it's a, another topic that we definitely should delve into a little bit more, as we have before. And we did mention this year, for this year, that we may get into more Native American side of things, because I think there is a truth to it. And I think there's a truth to their history. And I think we, sh we can learn a lot more from what they know, because they've been, as Dr. Clark said, and you said as well, Lucy, they've been uncorrupted. It's, it's the purest and the truest form 
of a story, but then it also brings up the idea of whether or not they smoked the peace pipe. And so, again, you've got things <laughs> on the table that you have to uh, sort of weigh the both sides of things. But uh, I, I do want to thank Dr. Clark for coming on. It was very, really interesting to talk to her about it and sort of pick her brain as to um, what she thought and what, what the Native Americans thought that she spoke to about these story people. I'm just absolutely tickled because, as I said before, she is Eastern Bend Cherokee, which is what I am. So I was very, very proud to have her on the show tonight. So let's go to business. Uh, the Paranormal Review Radio Fan of the Week. This week is Brenton Fawcett of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. He likes Tupac, Eminem, Coldplay, Family Guy, South Park, playing cards and hanging out with his dog. Uh, Breton messaged us recently, and he said that he just discovered our show a few months ago, and it really helped answer some questions. He had a tragedy occur in his house, and long story short, he thinks that the person that was involved is still there. And he wanted to tell us that the show has really helped him, and he wanted to say thank you to us. So congratulations, Breton. Thank you so much for being a fan, and congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> Are you having a hard time? Are you smoking the peace pipe over there? Not yet. <laughs> Not yet. Well, Brenton, uh, thank you. Uh, you know, you're welcome. Uh, you know, we do this show for our listeners. Uh, you know, there are hundreds of other shows out there that talk about the paranormal, especially within Blog Talk, but other networks out there that talk about it as well. And so uh, I'm glad that you found our show. Uh, you found our show interesting enough and in that it, whatever it is that we spoke about helped you get through or helped you find answers that uh, you were hopefully looking for and put your mind at ease because that's why we do this show. So don't forget, if you want to be a Paranormal Review Radio fan of the week, just like us on Facebook or subscribe to us on YouTube. Lucy's going to be posting some of the shows, the previous shows that we've had uh, pretty soon. So you'll be able to catch it on there if you don't like to go on Blog Talk. But uh, catch us on Facebook or on YouTube at Paranormal Review Radio. Well, the question of whether we're alone is one that seems to be changing from are we alone to where and when have we been contacted. More and more evidence is being found and related that points to the fact that we have had a whole lot of contact with others from other planets. We have to stop thinking that we are the only form of life in this universe and begin to accept that we may have had visitors that come here regularly. Um, do we welcome them or do we close our eyes to their presence? And most importantly, why are they here? Only time will tell, and until then, we can only speculate. We do want to thank Dr. Clark again for coming on the show. It was an eye-opening discussion. So from star people, we move to spirit people. Next week, it will be a very special show. Anthony and I will be conducting an ITC Ghost Box EVP session live on air with all of our listeners. Now, this is the first time that we're going to conduct a session between Chicago and New York. So let's see if we can have some spirits talk to each other in different states at the same time. This is going to be an exciting show for everyone. Thank you, everyone, for listening and being part of the Paranormal Review Radio family. It is growing every week. Thank you, Anthony, for another spectacular show. So until next week, Space Cadets, keep your eyes and minds open and have a paranormal week. Good night. Good night, everybody. Paranormal Review Radio.